Good morning, everyone. This is Live with the Hagley Historian. Coming to you from beautiful Wilmington, Delaware, Friday, April 3rd, 2020. Thank you for joining in. I am Lucas Clawson, historian with Hagley Museum and Library. This is coming to you as part of our Hagley from Home initiative, which is part of a larger museums and libraries from home initiative. So if you check out places, stuff around the web, you'll find not only Hagley Museum and Library, but other public history, public humanities institutions, putting information stuff out there around the web. So I uh, thank you all for, again, joining in this morning. I'm coming to you live with my production assistant behind me. This is Lucien. He was uh, with us last week. He'll be looking over my shoulder to make sure all of the tech, everything is working properly this week and uh, may come in to supervise at some point and give an intervention if he doesn't like what's going on. So so be aware that, that he is, is back there. So today I'm going to talk to you about something which is a little bit out of what a lot of you know me to talk about. So those of you who know me at Hagley and out in the wider world know that I specialize in the history of the American explosives industry, American military history, things that go through the air, explode, whiz, bang, boom, pop, so on and so forth. So talking about people like William Palman and American design is, is a little bit different, something that's a little bit out there. So what I want to walk through with you today is about how I came to know something about American interior and industrial design and through and how I got to know that through one of the collections at Hagley. So without further ado, William Palman and American Design. So the William Palman collection is one of the main ones we have at Hagley. It's a pretty interesting one that has to do with American interior industrial design. It focuses on this guy, William Carroll Palman. He was a native of Texas, ended up in New York City where he spent most of his life uh, conducting uh, American interior and industrial design, uh, pretty successfully too. And as I uh, put up in the flyer and other places, he's probably the most famous interior and industrial designer that you've never heard of. And we'll get to that as we uh, get into this collection and a little bit about why that is so. So how I came to know about this, so I'm going to walk you through with this too, a, a bit of a, on a bit of a personal journey in uh, how one gets to know about collections, how one as an historian gets to work with things like library collections. So when I first started at Hagley back in 2007, I went there as an intern through the University of Delaware to do collections processing. And what that means is when a library receives a new collection, you have to essentially take it apart and put it back together again. You have to gain what's called intellectual control, where you go through, make a thorough inventory, that way you know exactly what's there. And then you make a description of that collection so that researchers coming behind you can know what it is that they're seeing whenever they look at an inventory, whenever they read the description that you've written. That way they can assess whether or not this collection is something that's going to be useful to them. So this is something that I had to do with, with working with this collection. So in applying to be an intern, our former curator of manuscripts, Lynn Catanese, uh, put me onto this. Um, it actually ended up being the second collection that I worked on at Hagley. I was initially going there to work on this collection, but got diverted into the Wawa convenience store collection, which can be the uh, subject of a different live stream. But after I got through that, I circled back to William Palman. So I will admit in saying before that I uh, specialize in American military industrial technological history that I knew nothing about American interior and industrial design. So it took a lot of research on my part to figure out what it was that I was looking at, to get into the ins and outs of this collection and, and sort out what's there. So as we go through this today, you're, you're going to get the perspective not of a design historian, but of someone who is steeped in more the history of business and technology and, and what I took away from this collection and how I helped contribute to describing it for researchers. 
So where I started was with this tremendous book you see, this photograph that you see in the slide is of me holding one of William Pullman's publicity books. These things are huge, and this is where William Pullman had people who worked for him put in things like newspaper clippings and magazine clippings, any kind of publicity stuff to show off to customers the sorts of things that his firm could do. So whenever you open it up, this is uh, one that he did for Lord and Taylor in New York uh, in the 1930s for work that he did there. So these are what these things look like. They're absolutely huge. So this is how I started my process of learning about William Pullman, because he documented his business pretty well there. So in, in getting into other bits and pieces of the collection, uh, this, this gave me a good starting point. I knew what to look for. I knew some of the key names, dates, people who were involved. That way, as I was going through other bits of the collection, I, I know what I'm looking at. I know how best to describe it. So the, the next place that I went, and we're going to track William Pullman chronologically through, through some of the bits and pieces of this collection. He started off life as a traveling pipe salesman, of all things, and then took an interior design course through correspondence. So this was in the mid-1920s. So remember, he was born in 1900, so he was in his mid-20s as he was starting this course, and ended up going to the Parsons School of Design in New York. So what you're seeing on screen now are two watercolors from his notebook that he kept at Parsons. So some of the things that he learned were more in-depth about color, about how colors blend, how things fit together, learning about architectural details, about what styles, classical styles, new styles, things like that. So as he goes through his, his, the course of study at Parsons, he got the opportunity to go to Parsons Remote School in Paris. So the, the two images you see on the screen are watercolors that he did of interiors at the Palace of Versailles. So they're pretty intricate, pretty detailed pieces. So what you're seeing is architectural details of walls and paneling at Versailles. And notice on these, he's uh, giving you about shading and color. So these are, these are color samples. He also went on to do full drawings of interiors at Versailles. So one of a music room, another from a great hall. So what he's learning here is, is to be able to not only spot these ar architectural details and ideas, you know, but how to draw them, how to depict them, and then how to, to think about putting together images. So this is something that's pretty important in, in William Pallman's career and one of the really important bits that he takes away from Parsons School of Design. But he didn't spend all of his time in Paris, and remember this is the late 1920s, just looking at Versailles. He also took in some of the more modern interiors of, of Paris and throughout France. So what you're seeing at the image at left is a library reading room. Of course, I couldn't not throw in a library reading room, being that I work for a library. And then a dining room at right. So not only is he looking at classical architecture, classical details... But he's looking at the most modern stuff, the most modern styles too. So he's learning to identify all these different things. And so there are about 15 notebooks from his time at Parsons where he documented all the various styles, the things that he learned, all the, the bits and pieces of style design that are out there that he will apply later. So he graduated from the Parsons School of Design in 1929 and moved back to New York to set up private practice. One of the places that was on his radar was Lord and Taylor in New York. They were known as one of the more innovative department stores in New York during the 1920s and 1930s for things like these window displays, so setting up clothing on mannequins and windows, putting it out there for the public. That way people can see products and know what they're getting, know what the store is selling. So William Pullman initially got hired to work for Lord and Taylor after running his own firm for a bit to sell furniture. So one of the things that he hit on in, in selling this furniture, and this is a picture of William Pullman from the 1930s uh, sitting in front of a pretty elaborate screen. So one of the things that he noticed in, in selling furniture is it was hard to get people to envision why they needed a piece of furniture if you're just looking at like a chair sitting in the middle of the floor or looking at a couch or a table that it doesn't 
invigorate you. It doesn't make you think of, of what it could look like. So remember back to all that training at Parsons, all this thinking of styles and, and blending things together and using fabrics and interiors and blending colors, those sorts of bits. He applies that by making model rooms at Lord & Taylor. So as a way to sell furniture, he thought, well, if we can make people see this stuff in context, why don't I design these gorgeous rooms? That way people can see this stuff. They can know what it'll look like in their own home. So he started this in the mid-1930s. This is a photograph of a model room from 1937. So he's the first person to really start doing this for department stores. Lord and Taylor absolutely loved it because they saw that furniture started flying off the shelves. People loved coming in and being able to see what this stuff would look like, plus get ideas on how this furniture would look in their home. And this photograph is of the same room taken from a different angle. So it's not like it's just half of a room that he set up. He decorated an entire room. So keeping in mind that this is a pretty important thing, you know, that folks love this, that whenever customers came to Lord & Taylor, they saw these rooms, they knew what it would look like, the furniture would look like, and would buy it, take it home. So Lord & Taylor promoted William Palman a bit. They made him one of their interior design experts. So one of the things that you could get when you came to Lord & Taylor was William Palman's expert advice, not only on the type of furniture you should buy, but also on how you should decorate your home buying fabrics from Lord & Taylor, furniture from Lord & Taylor, window treatments, those sorts of things. So William Palman and Lord & Taylor took it just beyond a typical model room and started making larger events of these things. The rooms got way more elaborate. So this is a photograph of a room that he did to, uh, there's a lot going on here, using mirrors, using marbleized fabrics so the chair in the foreground is made to look like a piece of marble with a fabric that stretched around it the same types of stuff on, on the walls. The ceiling is made to look like a marquee tent. So not only are they selling this furniture in an innovative way, but they're thinking of ways to get people in the door, do something big as life and twice as natural, so to speak, something flashy to, to get people in to uh, take a look at, at what's there. Another example of one of these incredibly elaborate rooms from the 1939 to 41 time period is this uh, carpet, which uh, looks like cat or dog fur all over the place. And then the uh, mannequin in the background is sitting on a couch smoking a cigarette. So this gives you an idea of, of how Pullman is developing his design sense, but realizing that a bit of showmanship has to go with this too. You have to go a little bit over the top to really grab people's attention and, and pull them in. So we have a, a question from Philip Leach, how far reaching was Lord and Taylor at the time, one store versus many? So Lord and Taylor was mostly based in New York at this time, but uh, their reach ended up uh, being big not because of the number of stores, but because they were a trendsetter in New York. So uh, what they did, a lot of other department stores followed on. So uh, that's one of the things to uh, to keep in mind whenever they uh, you. you they're doing. So so this was a trendsetter, a pretty big trendsetting thing. Before long, a lot of stores in New York were doing similar stuff. William Palman worked at Lord & Taylor up until 1942, whenever he joined the U.S. Army Air Corps in the camouflage section. So he worked out of Jefferson Barracks in St. Louis, Missouri. So his job was to teach American Army Air Corps men how to camouflage planes, not so much in the air, but camouflage them on the ground so that whenever planes are flying around, it's hard to tell what it is that you're looking at. So he ended up staging a few mock battles to show how this stuff worked, even one for Franklin Roosevelt in 1943, and he called it the Battle of Camouflage Hill. So this ended up getting uh, pretty big publicity in some of the local newspapers. So he's pretty successful at that, but he's applying this Parsons training and what he's learned at Lord & Taylor so far about, again, blending colors, hiding things in plain sight, making uh, interesting color combinations so that you, you don't necessarily know what you're looking at with, with planes that are in the air. Another interesting thing that Palman did during World War II is that he got transferred to a, a section of the Army Air Corps where he got to fly throughout Europe and the Pacific talking with soldiers about what to do when the war was over, about job opportunities that are available, 
uh, the things that you could do whenever wherever the war was ending. So that by this point, especially after the invasion of Normandy, the United States could see that things may be winding down before long and wanted to get these soldiers ready to go. So hold on to this thought about William Palman and, and veterans because this will come back pretty soon. So in 1946, the war is over. William Palman exited the Army Air Corps at the uh, rank of lieutenant colonel, by the way. He came back to New York City and started his own interior design practice, which he called William Palman Associates. So he set up on his own, but pulled in other friends, some of them veterans, a couple of Navy and Army and Army Air Corps veterans to help him uh, in the interior, setting up an interior and industrial design firm. So he has to get his name out there. He's been gone for a little while. A lot of people remembered him as the guy from Lord & Taylor, but he'd been gone from 1942 to 1946. So he's he's got to jump in and use the showmanship, you know, get his name back in the lights. So one of the first things that he set up was called the Decorating by Air Service. He started this almost immediately in 1946. And so what this meant was a, uh, a deluxe way to decorate people's homes outside of New York. And so decorating by ear is exactly what it meant, that he would come to your home, look at things, come up with an interior design, purchase the furniture, and then load it onto aircraft. X uh, C-46 and C-47 planes from the U.S. Army Air Corps, piloted by veterans, who would fly the stuff to your home city. They would load it on trucks, take it, and put your house together. So this is a, a pretty interesting and innovative thing. And the photograph you see is of William Palman supervising stuff that was getting ready to be loaded onto a C-47 plane. So as you can imagine, this was an incredibly difficult thing to do and wildly expensive. But it was a, a publicity coup that was uh, got William Palman out there, got his name up in lights. You know, but it was also a way to help find something for veterans to do after the war. So this is something that was quite important to him that uh, as he moves forward in time, he wanted to make sure that uh, if there was someone who was a veteran that worked in the interior design field to try to take them under his wing to uh, to help them out, to make sure that they uh, got access to the GI Bill and to the educational opportunities that were available to to veterans during that time. So another way that William Palman got himself out there during his, his early years, or his early uh, restart, so to speak, in New York, was to uh, work for Bonwit Teller Department Stores. So this was a, uh, a chain that was uh, throughout the uh, New England, mid-Atlantic. They were, they were somewhat out into the Midwest. So Bonwit Teller put him on retainer from 1948 to 51 to design some of the stores, to give them an overhaul. The Bonwit Teller felt like they were pretty behind in their look and brought William Palman in to change things around, not only in how the place looked, but in things like flow. So he's working in some of his industrial design chops on this, some of the stuff that he learned as a student at Parsons, but then also through the Army Air Corps, too, learning about logistics in the military and how those things work. So it's, it's pulling flow and design together. So with this photograph, you're looking at one of the ladies' dressing rooms slash showrooms. So the dressing rooms are in the back. This is a, a woman coming through wearing a dress out of the dressing rooms. But there's a mix of classical elements like the, the settees that are around. Some of the motifs on the wall harken back to Versailles and some of these uh, really classical looking design elements. So they wanted to make people feel at home, you know, make them feel like they were sitting in the lap of luxury. But also combine the classical with the whimsical. So this is uh, one of the kids' dressing rooms slash show areas. So all of the carts, there's a cart that you see in the foreground, which are on these uh, big rubber wheels where they could bring in racks of clothes for you to look at. And on the back wall is a, a mural designed for children to make children feel at home. So all the furniture in this room is low. The lighting is set up to be fun and nice, lots of bright colors. But this is part of, of again, what gets William Palman rolling, gets his business rolling. So working with the Bong with Teller department store, but this is what sets to what would be called his eclectic style. So this is mixing that whimsical and classical sort of style together. So you could see something like a modern child's mural mixed with design elements that he picked up from Versailles, things like that. So it's a nice blending of pieces together here. 
William Pullman, another thing that, that sets him apart and really makes him an innovative person is that he was one of the first people in the U.S. to design for television, design for the television. So once World War II was over and he saw how people wanted consumer goods and saw how the television was something that was gaining in popularity, one of the things that he started doing was, was working with companies like General Electric. So the photograph you see here, the drawing that you see here, is uh, one that he did for General Electric to show different design ideas for how to incorporate the television into the home. Because he, he again, rightly saw that the television was going to be something important to people. Know that they were that would be the focal point of the living room rather than some other type of piece of furniture. So this was something he, he thought about pretty early. So this ends up being in the mid 1950s when he when he takes this up. And then this image that you're seeing here is uh, one of many. They're they're pretty large. These things are maybe uh, 20 inches wide. They're they're huge. So these are some design drawings that he did and renderings that he did to, to help make the sale. But we'll we'll circle back to what these are and how they look a little bit later. But designing for the television, this is something that's pretty important for him. So he's pretty innovative in that and ends up being a trendsetter among other interior and industrial designers and in thinking about the television as the focal point for a room. So one of the ways that he dealt with that was to come up with his own furniture line. This stuff is called momentum furniture. And the reason why is that you can see that this furniture is on semi-pneumatic wheels. So his idea with this was to have a piece of furniture that you could easily move around. Since a lot of people were new to televisions that they may have already had established styles, maybe they didn't want the television to be the thing in the middle of the room all the time, you could put this furniture on wheels, put your television, which at that point was set into a nice cabinet so it looked like a nicer piece of furniture than most televisions today do. You can have your living room set up with your coffee table as the focal point, then when you want to watch television, you wheel all of your furniture around, rearrange your room, and then you reel everything back whenever the television program is done. So it makes things easy to deal with, it makes things easy to move around. So this is one of Paulman's uh, first and largest forays into industrial design, working with a furniture company. So this line of furniture, Momentum, was made by the Contempo Company, headquartered out of New York. But this is their catalog from 1949. So a lot of this is going on in the 40s, 1940s, early 50s, the Momentum line of furniture. So there are many, many catalogs, design drawings for this Momentum furniture, lots of stuff in this collection to document how he did this and why he did this. So this is all pretty interesting to me, again, knowing nothing about interior and industrial design, to understand how someone like William Pullman would think about rearranging the television rearranging, rearranging rooms to be around television, thinking in new ways about what design should be and how people's homes should look. So throughout this time, William Pullman starts growing his business. So he goes from a small couple-person shop to a full-scale setup. There's a couple of uh, places that he had in New York, but you can see from his offices what you're looking at in these photographs. The one on the left is uh, some of his material samples, catalogs, one of the design areas, the uh, photograph on the right, is the place where he would meet with his clients. So he wanted to make them feel comfortable and at home whenever he did his initial consultations and brought them in. So he did all this work in-house, was able to hire enough people at his height. He ended up having about 20 people, a little over 20 people who worked for him, people who were designers, office managers, the full gamut of people, even draftsmen, artists who he kept on his payroll. And one of my favorite photographs of his office is uh, of this, the drawing and drafting room. So uh, what's laid out on the tables are some of the design drawings for uh, some of the work that he did, and then on the back wall are these renderings, which uh, I showed you the one from for television, and I'll show you a few more later on. So this is one of the main ways that William Pullman could help people envision what it was that he was designing for them, what things the finished product was going to look like, was through uh, these large color renderings. And again, you can see those on the back wall. So I'm able to learn a lot about William Pullman based on some of these photographs, but one of the unique and incredibly important parts of this collection 
is that it in, contains his business records. A lot of American design record sets around only include things like their publicity books, so like the large book that I showed you at first, uh, photographs, things that are outward facing, but not a lot of internal kinds of documents, not their actual books, you know, the, the nitty gritty of what the business did and how they did it. So William Paulman's records are fantastic because whenever he closed his office in 1977, he literally took everything out of the office, boxed it up, and sent it on. So nothing got cold, nothing got taken out. It's all there, even down to boxes and boxes of material samples. So you can document absolutely everything that happened with his business. And this is an absolute boon for people who do business history, but also for design history, too, because you can go back and chart how William Palman got jobs, how he interacted with clients, how he thought about the work that he did. So it's, it's a pretty important thing. So it was interesting to me, too, looking at this, because it helped me, again, as someone who knew nothing but was learning a lot about interior and industrial design, get into how this business worked and think more broadly about how to describe it and how to help people get access to this collection. So it documents the process, as I mentioned. So uh, there's a lot of things like these two drawings, which are not formal design drawings, formal blueprint drawings, of which there are quite a few in the collection. These are like his designs, his sketches, some of the doodles, where he was laying things out, figuring out the process. And this is a really important part of this collection, because again, you can document how he came to his conclusions, how he interacted with customers. You can see a design change from when he started interacting with the client to the finished product, and the entire process of this is documented. So throughout all this, William Palman is putting together a, a pretty coherent, close philosophy, and it's called simplicity. Really, really simple. So the uh, drawing that you see here is one that he did for a later uh, syndicated column, but uh, his core thing, if you had to boil it down to something, when in doubt, keep it simple. He wanted to design things that had a little bit of permanence that people could use over and over again. Clean design in that things weren't going to go stale. Design wasn't going to go stale. Furniture wasn't going to go stale, so to speak, that it wasn't so tied into a yearly fashion. That there's a time and place for changing fashion, but for most people, as, as William Palman threw out there, they didn't, weren't, weren't going to be able to afford that. You know, changing fashion was for people who were incredibly wealthy, but for a majority of folks who were out there, they're going to have to have something that they can buy once and keep in their homes. So how this played out in some of his design, this is an example of a kitchen slash dining room that he designed for a, a New York apartment. It was supposed to be simple, functional, and lasting. Lasting is impermanent. So the countertops were made so that they're easy to clean, they're easy to access, everything in the kitchen is easy to get to. And this is something that's going on with other designers as well, but this is, this is a tenet of Paulman's design philosophy that he pushed on all of the people who worked for him and is a hallmark of his design, but something that he was able to push out to other designers was this simple, functional, lasting idea, you know, that things were going to be, again, clean, cheap, but durable, uh, easy to clean, easy to deal with. And then also build a lot of utility into his design. So this uh, cabin that you see in the background, these are uh, multiple folding drawers and shelves that come out of a kitchen pantry. So William Palman is not the person to invent this sort of thing, but he's one of the people who helped popularize it by pushing it out to the public that American designers should be taking this up, should be thinking about these designs, think about utilitarian things, especially in city living. Remember that he's in New York, and a lot of the, a lot of the designs that he worked with, a lot of the people that he worked with, a lot of his clients were just average New Yorkers or people who were in and about New York. So you have to think about space saving. You know, How do you do that in a way that looks good, makes you feel good when you're in the space? You know, stuff that isn't cramped, stuff that isn't terribly expensive. So this is something to keep in mind as we roll through William Palman's designs. This is a, another example of some of his design. This is one of these uh, large rendering boards. This is the uh, Steinbeck House in Rye, New York. This ended up being uh, one of his more famous jobs. You can see a, a television over toward the left. 
and examples of his momentum furniture in the uh, little settee that's in the foreground. But this gives you an idea of, of how he designed not for apartments, but for larger homes. And it's, again, about this clean design, open spaces, places that whenever people go in, it makes them feel good about being there, and they can uh, be comfortable in their own space. A couple of jobs that he did, which uh, helped get him a little bit of notoriety during this time and then throw his ideas out there, was uh, getting more high-profile clients. So uh, one of the things that he got to do was a design for the governor of South Carolina's office in 1958. So uh, he publicized the heck out of this in a lot of major newspapers and design catalogs. But you can see from this office, part of the idea was that it looked high 1950s, or late 1950s, early 1960s. This kind of clean design, lots of woodwork, something that was functional and elegant where you can bring people in, feel comfortable about your office space. So he was uh, throwing this out there as, as what he could do for more higher profile clients and more powerful people, so not just the average person. But this also gets his name out if someone can say, hey, look, he's designing for the governor of South Carolina. Maybe I want him to come and design things for me. So it's a way for William Palman to work himself out into the public eye and some of his design philosophies out into the public eye. Another large job he got around this time was the President Hotel in Hong Kong. This ended up being a huge job for him. He took a couple of trips to the other end of the earth, quite literally, to uh, do this work. William Palman was brought in to do not only the lobby, which is shown here in one of the design rendering boards, but the entire space. So he did the restaurants inside. He did the guest rooms, the bars, the lounges, all of the functional spaces, and then set up the flow. So for how you would walk into the building, go to the reception desk, how you enter and exit the elevators, how you enter and exit the kitchens when you're bringing things in and out. So this is helping establish him even further as an industrial designer and interior designer because he's working on these commercial spaces. So William Palman starts building a nice business for himself within William Palman Associates for, for doing these, these restaurants, hotels, kitchens, things like that. So it's a, not only gaining him notoriety, but getting him larger and larger clients. So this spreads out to places all over New York City. So he ends up doing restaurants in the, um, the uh, what's now the MetLife building in New York, working with the Seeger building in New York, buildings and restaurants around Rockefeller Center, things all over town. So a lot of things that are still there and things that you may have even still heard of. Another example of his uh, wonderful designs is the top of the Columbus Bar and the Columbus Hotel in Miami, Florida. That uh, This was a pretty high 1950s design all the way up to the eye-searing colors on the uh, seats and around the walls. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, photographs of the top of the Columbus Bar and the Columbus Hotel, which is easier on the eyes. I don't want to blow out anybody's retinas looking at this, but they are wonderful shades of fuchsia, teal, pink, green, and everything in between. So it's absolutely incredible, the, the colors that are in this. But again, an idea of what this is supposed to look like, how, how his commercial and, interior design, commercial and interior designs worked through the 1950s. So these are things that are gaining him notoriety. Another important job he did was within the Empire State Building in New York. So, of course, I've got to bring this back around to DuPont, that... Uh, he had a pretty strong connection with DuPont with their textile fibers operation and designing fabrics uh, through some of the main fabric companies and working with them, but then also doing design work for DuPont. So this was their textile fiber showroom in the Empire State Building in New York from uh, 1955. That He did uh, three showrooms for the DuPont company in the Empire State Building. So this was just one of three, all three of them for the uh, textile fibers department. So this was to show off DuPont fabrics show off uh, because everything in the room was uh, covered in a DuPont fabric. All the floor coverings, wall coverings had something to do with DuPont. So it was a showcase of, of DuPont work that William Palman collaborated with. During this time, he was a tremendous advocate for American interior and industrial designers partnering with American industry. And so why is this important? Why is this an innovative thing? that, remember, after World War II, he rightly saw that there were a lot of people who weren't able to buy things during World War II who wanted to buy stuff afterwards. So there was a tremendous market of people 
in the late 40s, early to mid 50s who wanted things. So he thought, why are we as interior and industrial designers not tapping into this desire for stuff? And so why not partner with a logical partner organization, industry, especially things like the furniture industry, the fabrics industries, floor coverings, anybody that they can get involved with to help design things that people are going to want. So getting into furniture helped trying to uh, influence the furniture industry to make things that are not going to go out of style in a year. Back to the idea of things that are easy to take care of, easy to clean, easy to maintain, fabrics that hold their color, that uh, whenever the kids spill grape juice on that it's easy to clean off, stuff like that. That these are the things that Paulman and later on other people who were part of his profession started pushing into industry, but then also they partnering them, themselves to design furniture. So uh, some of the more outlandish stuff being that momentum furniture, but then also getting into more clean and, and simple designs. So uh, the, the catalog that you see is for the Weinberg Furniture Company. These are uh, not things that Paulman designed, but things that Paulman ended up selling through his office, the William Paulman Associates in New York. So it ended up being a bit of a, a, a nice working relationship with uh, various segments of industry in the American design industry during this time. William Palman was a master of publicity, so this is one of the huge things that stuck out to me in dealing with this collection, that he had an idea and he wanted to get it out there and wanted to get it out there in a big way. So uh, one of the biggest ways that he did it is he wrote books. This is an example of the William Palman Book of Interior Design, first issued in 1955. It went through several editions all the way up through 1969 updating for things like newer types of floor coverings, newer types of materials, whatever he updated his design philosophy, things like that. It ended up being a, a bestseller and a pretty influential book, not only among American interior designers, but also among the public. That way somebody could get a hold of this and say, wow, look, this is what I can do. And one of the things to say about William Palman is that he never advocated for people to do a complete interior design on their own. He advocated for them to hire an interior designer to help them figure out how to best deal with their spaces. So the book like this was more meant to show you what good design can be rather than as a do-it-yourself guide. Although there were bits of, of do-it-yourself stuff in there, like knowing how to pick out a good fabric, and knowing how to pick out a nice curtain, picking out nice colors whenever you go to the furniture store, stuff like that. So this is the design philosophy that he's throwing out in the book. He also wrote a syndicated column called A Matter of Taste. So this ran nationwide through uh, papers throughout the United States. It started in 1962 and went up until he retired from doing interior and industrial design in 1977. So it included advice about what to look for in good design. Again, not how to necessarily do it yourself, but more so, you know, what to look for, what to be aware of whenever you're reaching out to an interior designer or thinking about doing some things on your own. They include these absolutely beautiful drawings. So the drawing you see at right is an ink and ink wash drawing of a, a living room, which he designed to show off using Chinese elements. So it's a Chinese screen that you see in the background and Chinese-inspired furniture throughout the room. So this is a pretty popular column. Again, it ran throughout the nation for uh, over a decade. So remember those design renderings. So this will give you a, an idea of how large these renderings are. And they were all full color. So William Palman stood over six feet tall. So this gives you a, a bit of an idea of scale and looking how big they are or seeing how, how large these things are. So part of the point of these was to take them out and show off what he could do. So photographs work. A majority of the photographs during that time, though, were black and white, you know, and doing uh, work in newspapers, magazines. They often didn't have a lot of space for color photographs, but you could set up and do a presentation with these, and you can see it in full living color, and you can see that it's huge. Plus, there's just something about an artist's rendering which captures your imagination in a little bit different of a way than perhaps a photograph would, and he knew this. And that's part of the reason for throwing it out there. So this harkens back to his entire experience as an interior and industrial designer. So thinking back to the Parsons School of Design and everything he learned there, and then all of the practice 
learning from that point up to the 1950s, whenever this becomes a big thing for him. Another unique way of spreading the word, and I'm so absolutely thrilled that these are in our collection, is model rooms. So William Palman would make these model rooms to be able to carry them around and show people in 3D what these things would look like, or set up displays. This particular one he designated an explorer study, so this was done for the American Leather Institute, so it includes a lot of manly stuff like leather and you see the fireplace over at left and floor coverings that, that look you know manly and tough. But that's part of the idea with this is that whenever you see these you can get an idea of, of what it's going to look like but you can create one of these small rooms and travel it around that way the designer themselves doesn't have to go with this stuff for you to be able to see it. So Paulman created some of these on spec to uh, show people what what could happen, what things could look like. He also created them for corporate clients. So some of the bigger clients that he worked with, he would uh, make mock-ups of interiors. That way you can see, hey, this is what your interior is going to look like. He also did interiors, model rooms like this one, which is a bedroom, which was a part of a traveling exhibit called Elegance to Scale, operated by the American Institute of Interior Design. So this was a showcase of a prominent American and interior designers in the mid-1960s where they would make these model rooms, the AIID, later the AID, American um, Institute of Design, would shop these things out, put together a full-scale exhibit, send them to art museums, send them to trade shows, all over the place. So we're pretty lucky at Hagley that we've got uh, the two that I just showed you, plus a couple of more that... Uh, are pretty neat. They're also uh, wired for electricity so you can turn the lights on inside. They're absolutely beautiful and hopefully we'll be able to show off a couple of these someday at Hagley. So stay tuned for that. William Pullman also did a couple of high profile jobs. So this is another way to leverage publicity, get his name up in lights. One of the big ones that he did was uh, this restaurant called the Forum of the Twelve Caesars in Rockefeller Center in New York, which was uh, built in 1958. So this was a restaurant meant to be, again, big as life and twice as natural. So it was huge and uh, literally huge, but then also over the top in some of the things that you would see. That uh, the 12 Caesars, there were paintings of all 12 of the uh, the Caesars, who uh, the, of the uh, Roman Caesars, plus they had mosaics on the walls, all of the uh, restaurant uh, menu options had to do with, with Rome or things being set on fire. This ended up being a pretty popular place for folks to visit. So there's photographs of uh, select singer Burl Ives having uh, midday meals at the Forum of the Twelve Caesars. So this was a, a pretty popular and over-the-top sort of restaurant in New York that uh, William Palman got involved with. So it's a way to get his name out there and draw attention to himself. So fun fact... Any of you out there who are fans of the show Mad Men, so uh, one of the episodes, uh, there's a, a meeting of folks in the restaurant forum of the Twelve Caesars. So the producers of Mad Men, to uh, know what that interior looked like, contacted us at Hagley because we have a model of the forum of the Twelve Caesars, similar to the one I just mentioned and showed you photographs of, but then also all of these lovely photographs of what the interior looked like. So they were able to recreate a portion of the interior of the Forum of the Twelve Caesars restaurant based upon research and materials that we sent them from this collection at Hagley. So this is our uh, connection to Hollywood for you today. Another prominent job that he did was the Four Seasons restaurant in the Seagram Building in New York. So this was a, a pretty famous restaurant, the uh, building, the Seagram Building itself, designed by Mies van der Rohe, and a lot of the architecture done by Philip Johnson. So William Pullman's part in all this was not so much designing what the restaurant itself looked like, but some of the elements within the restaurant. He's the one that came up with the idea of the Four Seasons. So one of the, the kind of the deals with the restaurant is that they would change the seasons and so change all the decor. So you, in the photographs that you see both left and right, they would change for spring, summer, win, autumn, and winter. Uh, they would change the trees around, the color of the decor, even the designs on the plates would change. So he uh, set up all of that, also set up the uh, the flow, so things moving out of the kitchen into the restaurant, how you enter and exit the building. 
This was a pretty opulent restaurant and was open in New York up until just a few years ago in almost the same setup that William Palman and Philip Johnson had set it up. It was a pretty sad day to see it close down, uh, but we do have full documentation of that. You know, The only set of uh, full design drawings for the Four Seasons restaurant is available with us at Hagley, so a pretty valuable thing. But a high-profile job that William Palman was involved with and was able to leverage in his publicity. So he's also pretty good at dealing uh, with, with industry in a different way. So this is uh, him being a Lord Calvert Whiskey man of distinction in 1951. So this was a pretty popular thing for the Lord Calvert Whiskey brand to pick out people who, men who were uh, distinct in some way. So William Palman got that distinction in 1951. So this is a photograph of him sitting on one of his Momentum brand tables with, the, uh, with a bulldog. And it's pretty interesting how this worked out for him because a lot of folks who liked Lord Calvert Whiskey appreciated that he was a man of distinction, but there were a lot of people in the United States in that period who were teetotalers, didn't like the fact that he was out there uh, advertising vicariously for Lord Calvert Whiskey. So he got a lot of nasty letters from people saying that he ought not do that, that he was uh, going against religion, going against uh, progressive principles, William Palman loved it. He didn't care that he got nasty letters in the mail because he felt that any publicity was good publicity, and it was a way to keep his name up in the light, so to speak. So anything that happened like that, he absolutely loved it. So he didn't mind stirring up a bit of controversy now and then. One of the ones being one of the controversies was, again, being on the uh, Lord Calvert Whiskey advertising campaign as a man of distinction. So remember that William Palman advocated uh, design for the television, he also didn't mind leveraging it for himself. So this is a photograph of Palman appearing on television. So he uh, had no problem mixing with radio and television personalities, himself going on television to talk about his designs using some of these rendering boards that I showed you in the television programs. Pretty interesting stuff here, too, that he was innovative in, in getting out there as a designer and putting a face on interior and industrial design for the American public. So it's not just seeing uh, photographs of these people in particular design magazines, but you're seeing them on television. You're hearing their voices on the radio. So they're becoming part of public consciousness uh, through some of the work that William Palman did. He was one of the innovators for the American design field in this area. So getting out there through television and radio to spread the word. Also, holding publicity shoots in his homes. So both of these photographs are uh, photographs of his homes. The one on the left is uh, in Bedford, New York. The one on the right is one of his apartments in New York City. But letting photographers come in and do fashion shoots, uh, publicity shoots within the home. So getting his own house out there, opening up his own home to uh, publicity shoots is another way to, to help leverage publicity and get his name up in lights. So this is a pretty important thing for William Palman ended up becoming a, a pretty important thing with uh, American interior designers. And he also had no problem making fun of himself. Pretty interesting stuff, too. So the uh, photograph at left is uh, William Palman spoofing at Christmas, and that is William Palman in his underwear standing in a picture frame wearing a, uh, a, a knit cap. Uh, but he had no problem doing stuff like this, trying to get laughs out of people. The photograph at right is of him uh, wearing a turban at an American Interior Design meeting uh, where they put on a show to try to make everybody laugh. So one of his shticks was that uh, that shows he would often have ladies come in on roller skates holding up design renderings or pieces of fabric, you know, ways to really grab people's attention. But uh, had no problem doing this, you know, took his design and his profession seriously, but not himself so much that he, he couldn't poke fun of himself at a bit to, to get people's attention and, and get... Their, uh, get their, their attention on him and what he was doing. So to, to sum William Palman up, this is a, a great quote from him from January 1963. My greatest satisfaction is in my work in helping people to live better and getting to know them and thinking that perhaps I've influenced their lives in a good way. Doesn't that sound like Pollyanna? It did seem like Pollyanna, so to speak, and what he meant by that was kind of pie in the sky, you know, thinking 
you know, that he could have a bigger reach than he could, you know, that life would, would, would be better than it actually is. But this is genuinely how he felt about his design work. And something that he pulled through, one of the through lines that you figure out pretty quickly in the collection and through his designs is that this is something he really believed in. It's not just something that he said to sell stuff, but it was something that, that he genuinely felt in, in dealing with his clients and in throwing his ideas out there to the larger world is that he really wanted to help people have nice places to live, that they feel good in their space, that they feel good about themselves through their space. So uh, one of the things that, that really stuck out to me and helped me understand William Palman and, and going through this collection and thinking about him as a person. So Palman practiced all the way until 1977. So in 1977 he retired closed his business in New York and uh, moved to uh, Guadalajara in Mexico. And that's where he died in 1987, although he kept an apartment in New York all the way up to the end of his life. So this collection is, is pretty interesting. When he closed down his business in 1977, he initially sent it to Winterthur, our uh, companion partner institution here in Delaware. So he went there because of their focus on antiques, and uh, on uh, stuff like that, on, 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 because he was a big antique dealer and, uh, and dealt with, with those sorts of things. That uh, Winterthur uh, had this collection from 1977 up to about 2006, and uh, they decided that it just didn't fit their scope, and it would fit Hagley better, especially since Hagley started gaining design collections. So other designers who we have are uh, people like Raymond Lowy, who in his own right is a pretty inf important and famous guy, but then... Uh, People uh, like Thomas Lamb, who uh, did some of the handles that I showed a couple of weeks ago on the tour, and uh, Marshall Johnson, who's still alive. One of the collections, the collecting areas that are pretty big for us is interior and industrial design. So this ended up fitting in pretty well for us. So we got this collection in 2008, and so uh, or uh, 2007 rather, uh, and then I started working on it in 2007, 2008. Get my timeline timeline right here. So this is uh, where I'll leave you with William Palman. My uh, last image is his uh, book plate, which is uh, one of the pieces of the collection I absolutely, positively love. I think this is a, a pretty neat thing, and this shows up all over the collection in his papers and his publicity books. But uh, there is my take on William Palman. So we'll uh, take a second here. If anybody has any questions, you can uh, type them in. And I'll do my best to answer them for you. So we have a question here from uh, Pete. Uh, what do we know about his private life? Was his work his life? Pete, the answer to that is yes. Uh, we know a lot about his private life, in part because the, the professional is the personal, is the private for him. That uh, there's, there's not a lot of uh, things that, didn't uh, get all wrapped together with him that uh, the fact that he used his own home as a place to uh, show off his design philosophies to host uh, photographic sessions things like that that he was pretty upfront about his own life too uh, making sure that he showed up in the society columns and the papers about who uh, he had dinner with uh, people that he was around all of uh, the, uh, the the stuff that's um, you know, that he got himself involved with. Like every time he went to the theater, he made sure to show who he went with in, in a way to keep himself out there in the public eye. That uh, there's, there's again, not much about his private life that doesn't show up. And uh, there's a few little odds and ends, you know, mostly like a correspondence with his parents and uh, some of his really close and personal friends that are part of the collection that didn't show up in his public life. But by and large, it's all over the place. He's pretty out there with all of it. All right, I'll give just a second to see if uh, any more questions pop up. So while we wait, I want to encourage you all uh, to check us out on the web, www.hagley.org, to see everything that we're doing and what's going on during the shutdown and to keep uh, posted on updates about what's going to happen throughout the summer and the fall. Also, stick with us on our Facebook page, Hagley Museum and Library. You can uh, see other videos from around the institution, some that uh, I'm doing, some that other people are doing. Be sure to check those out. 
Uh, I'll also uh, keep you posted via my Facebook page, Lucas R. Clawson, Hagley Historian. Well, everyone, thanks for sticking with me today. And uh, I hope to uh, see you all again next week. We're going to keep doing these live streams uh, as long as we can keep doing them. As long as uh, Hagley is inaccessible to the public and the staff, I will be doing these from home. But we'll continue them as uh, long as you all want to see them. Thanks for joining in today, and I hope to see you all next week. Everybody stay safe out there.